Hey there, you've really piqued our curiosity with this one. Living with Bipolar 2 by Lee Hopkins. Seems like you're ready to go deep on this, huh? Like you're drawn to the lesser known corners of the bipolar world. And we are so here for it. Well, it's a world that's often overshadowed, you know. People hear bipolar and they immediately think of the extremes of bipolar first. But bipolar 2, that's a whole other landscape. Right. It's not always the Hollywood version of mania. This book, though, it really gets into the nitty gritty of what makes bipolar 2 its own thing. Like it talks about those periods of hypomania. But get this, the analogy they use, finding an extra fry at the bottom of the bag. Oh, I love that analogy. It's so true, though, isn't it? Because on the surface, finding that extra fry feels like a whip. Pure bonus, right? But as the book stresses, that's just one tiny part of a much bigger picture. And the bigger picture can be, well, complicated. The book actually shares this story about a graphic designer, Sarah, super talented, but her energy is like boom or bust. She'll crank out amazing work during these super productive periods, but then crash. It's like she's riding this energy wave, but it's impossible to predict when it'll crest or crash. And that unpredictability, that's a huge part of why diagnosing bipolar 3, it can be so tricky. It's like those mismatched socks in the back of your drawer. <laughs> you don't always realize they're there until you're digging deep, right? The book even says that a lot of people with bipolar 2, they don't even realize those hypomanic periods are like a signal of something more going on. They just think, oh, I'm on a roll and then bam, the bottom falls out. Which leads to the big question, how do you even begin to navigate a condition that looks so different from person to person? Well, that's where this idea of a spectrum comes in. The book uses this analogy, dining etiquette. There are like general rules we all kind of know, right? But how strictly you stick to them, the nuances, that all depends on the context. Love that. Just like there's no single right way to have dinner with everyone everywhere, that there's no one-size-fits-all experience of bipolar 2. So before we get into the nitty-gritty of diagnosis and treatment and all that, I'm kind of curious, where did all this even begin? Any fascinating historical tidbits about bipolar 2 in the book? Oh, totally. It actually dives into some pretty funny historical attempts at treatment. Did you know the ancient Greeks, they thought bloodletting would cure mood swings? Oh my gosh, no. What? Can you imagine? Makes you grateful for how far we've come in understanding the brain, right? Oh, absolutely. And it wasn't even that long ago, really, that we started to understand bipolar 2 as its own thing. The term bipolar disorder itself. That only came about in 1980. Wow, 1980. That recently. It's yeah. like we finally gave it a name and suddenly we could really start to see it, you know. Hmm. But what really struck me in living with bipolar 2, what really stayed with me, was how it goes beyond just listing out symptoms. And it digs into what bipolar 2 feels like, especially the depressive episodes. The author paints such a vivid picture of how different it is from what many people consider typical depression. Right. It really gets into the lived experience. One detail that jumped out at me was this whole thing about a dulling of the senses during depressive episodes. Like, colors seem less bright, food loses its taste, even touch feels muted. It's like someone hit the mute button on your whole world. Such a powerful way to describe it. It makes you realize just how deeply this condition can affect a person on every level. And we can't forget about the physical stuff, too. Mm. Because it's not just in your head, right? The fatigue, the aches, the digestive issues. The book makes it very clear that bipolar 2 depression, it's a whole body experience. It really does sound all-encompassing. It's like your mind and body are both feeling the weight of it. And as if it wasn't already complex enough, the book also gets into how gender can play a role in how bipolar 2 shows up. Oh, absolutely. Because it's not just about whether you have those highs and lows, but even those phases themselves might look different in men and women. So it's even more nuanced than we thought. Tell me more about these gender differences. Well, for example, the book highlights studies that suggest women with bipolar 2, they might experience more of those depressive episodes and fewer hypermanic ones compared to men. Plus, men often report more irritability and anger during their depressive periods, whereas women are more likely to experience it as sadness and tearfulness. Wow. So it's like there are these individualized weather patterns going on inside each person and understanding your own unique pattern is key. So how do we begin to navigate these complex emotional landscapes, mm -hmm. especially those up periods? They can be tricky, right? And that's where living with bipolar 2 really shines. You know, it dies into practical strategies, things you can actually do to manage both the ups and the downs. Because as great as that hypomania might feel sometimes, the book makes it clear that if you don't get a handle on it, things can get messy. Yeah, the book uses this analogy of that friend who convinces you to do karaoke after one too many 
fun in the moment, maybe not so fun the next day. Mm -hmm. So finding ways to harness that energy, keep it from going totally off the rails, that seems key. What kind of strategies are we talking about here? Well, one thing that surprised me was the emphasis on mindfulness and meditation. I mean, you'd think, meditate, when my brain's already going a mile a minute. But the book actually argues that mindfulness can help you spot those early warning signs of hypomania. Like, are your thoughts racing? Do you suddenly feel invincible? Mindfulness can help you catch those things early on and, like, ground yourself before things escalate. So instead of ending up on that karaoke stage, you're learning to recognize those urges and maybe choosing a different path. It's about having more control, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's about making conscious choices. The book also talks a lot about having a regular sleep schedule, which, let's be real, can be tough when you're hypomanic and your brain's telling you sleep is for the weak. Oh, tell me about it. It's like trying to convince a kid who's hopped up on sugar that it's bedtime. Good luck with that. Right. But the book stresses that consistent sleep it's super important for managing hypomania. It's like you're building this solid foundation so when those mood swings hit, you've got something stable to hold on to. I'm sensing a theme here. Structure, routine, it's almost like you're creating this framework to support yourself. Yeah. What other tools does the book recommend adding to this framework? Well, it talks about physical exercise as a way to channel all that excess energy. And of course, good old fashioned mood tracking, which can help you see those patterns, those triggers that are unique to you. Oh, I love that. Becoming a mood detective. It's like you're getting to know your bipolar, too. Exactly. And there's this thing called structured scheduling, which I know sounds a little intense. It does sound a tad rigid. Yeah. Yeah. But it's really not about turning your life into a spreadsheet. It's more about acknowledging that during those hypomanic periods, you might feel like you can take on the world, right? But that's not always realistic. So structured scheduling, it's about setting realistic goals, prioritizing what really matters, and finding a pace you could actually sustain, even when you feel like you could run a marathon. It's less about restriction, more about working with your energy, not letting it control you. Exactly. And speaking of support, the book really emphasizes how important it is to have people in your corner, friends, family, anyone you trust who can gently say, hey, are you sure you want to buy that? Or maybe hold off on starting that new project right now. It's like having that friend who can tell when you've had one too many drinks. And yeah. They're looking out for you. Exactly. Sometimes we all need that outside perspective. But of course, managing bipolar 2, it's not just about navigating those high periods. The book gets real about the depression, too. Yeah, it's a side of the condition that often doesn't get as much attention. And the book really captures how debilitating those depressive episodes can be. It doesn't sugarcoat it at all. The book describes this profound, pervasive state of low mood, which honestly just sounds heavy, you know? That emptiness, the hopelessness, losing interest in things you used to love. And it stresses how different bipolar 2 depression can be from what a lot of people think of as like typical depression. For one thing, the book explains that the depressive episodes, they tend to last longer and happen more often in bipolar 2. And some people, they might even experience these brief bursts of positivity, like in response to good news or something. But then, boom, the depression comes back even stronger. Yeah, it's like this cruel trick. The book actually uses the analogy of a friend saying something that briefly cheers you up, but then a couple hours later, the depression is back and you're like right back where you started. It really highlights that cyclical nature of bipolar 2 depression. Like you're stuck in this loop and you can't seem to get off. And that sensory dulling we were talking about before, that feeling of everything being muted, the book suggests that plays a big role in the depression too. Absolutely. It talks about how even simple things like a beautiful sunset or a delicious meal, they just lose their luster. Like the world's literally gone gray. And it's not just your mood or your senses either. The book points out that bipolar 2 depression, it manifests physically too. Fatigue, aches and pains, even digestive problems. It sounds utterly exhausting on every level. So knowing just how complex and how individual these depressive episodes can be, what kind of guidance does the book offer for getting through them? Well, it takes a really comprehensive approach. It talks about traditional therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, and medication, of course, but it also explores some alternative and complementary approaches, which I thought was really interesting. So it's acknowledging that there's not one magic solution, right? Uh, what works for one person might not work for another. And finding what works for you often means trying different things. 
Exactly. It's about building your own personal toolkit for managing your mental health. Okay, I like that. So let's dig into some of the tools in this toolkit. We touched on CBT briefly earlier. Can you tell us a little more about how it's used specifically for bipolar 2? So with CBT, it's like you're becoming this like thought detective, right? The book explains how CBT can help you pinpoint those thought patterns, those really negative ones that can like fuel those mood swings. It's like you're becoming aware of these thinking habits that aren't actually serving you and then figuring out how to swap them out for some healthier ones. It's like giving your brain an upgrade. I yeah. love that analogy. OK, so that's CBT. What about some of those other therapies the book mentioned? Well, it talks about this thing called interpersonal and social rhythm therapy or IPSRT. It focuses on the link between like your daily routines, your relationships and your moods. They're all connected, right? Totally. If my routine's out of whack, my mood is the first thing to go haywire. So IPSRT, it's about building those healthy routines and like strengthening those relationship skills that can help someone with bipolar too. Well, cope. Exactly. It's all about recognizing those patterns in your life and how they affect you. And then there's dialectical behavior therapy or DBT. Have you heard of that one? Yeah, I've heard of it. But to be honest, I don't really know much about it. Well, DBT is big on finding that balance, you know, accepting yourself as you are, but also learning those skills to handle those big emotions that can sometimes feel honestly overwhelming. So like you're building this whole toolkit, but this time it's for navigating those choppy emotional waters. Yeah. Love it. Okay, but you know me, I'm always curious about those less conventional routes. Anything in the book about those? Like alternative therapies? Oh, yeah, totally. It actually touches on some really interesting ones. Mindfulness-based stress reduction, for one. Light therapy, especially for people who are sensitive to seasonal changes. Yeah. And even acupuncture. The book emphasizes that, like, there's not just one path here. It's about finding what resonates with you. It's so empowering. Like oh. you get to build your own mood management plan. So cool. Right. And that's where the self-care stuff comes into. The book is big on that. Those foundational things, sleep, exercise, what you're eating. It calls them the holy trinity of self-care. And honestly, it's not hard to see why. For real. Yeah. Those things can make or break you no matter who you are. But the book doesn't just stop at the basics, right? Oh, no, it goes way beyond. It gets into managing stress, using those apps and trackers to keep tabs on your moods, your sleep, all that good stuff. Even something as simple as creating a calming space for yourself. It's about being intentional, proactive even, about creating an environment that supports you, nurtures you even. Creating that safe space. I love that. And then, of course, there's the whole social support piece. Mm. The book dedicated a whole chapter to that. It kept saying how hey, you don't have to go it alone. Because even superheroes need a sidekick or in this case, like a whole support team. The book talks about being open with loved ones, setting those healthy boundaries and knowing when to call on the pros, the therapists, the doctors. It even gives advice on navigating relationships at work, because let's face it, disclosing a mental health condition at work, that's a whole other ball game. Yeah. Definitely a personal decision with a lot to consider. But back to those pros for a sec, because we can't not talk about the medication piece, right? Mm. That's a biggie for a lot of people with bipolar, too. It is. And the book doesn't shy away from that. It gets into the different types of meds, how they work in the brain, all that. But it does it in a really approachable way. Like it uses this one analogy for mood stabilizers. Oh, tell me it's the wellies analogy. It is the wellies. It the book talks about how they're not always the most stylish footwear, but when it's muddy out there, you are so glad you have them. Such a perfect analogy. So the mood stabilizers, those are like the wellies of the bipolar two world. They're there to help you weather the storm. Exactly. The book talks about lithium, which is kind of the old standby, and then anticonvulsants like lamotrigine, which it says can be particularly useful for those depressive episodes. So they're like those specialized tools for when your mood starts to dip. Got it. What about antidepressants? I know those can be a little trickier for people with bipolar too. Right, you gotta be careful with those. The book's really upfront about that. Mm -hmm. Antidepressants, they need to be used super carefully in bipolar too because, and this is the kicker, sometimes they can actually trigger those hypomanic episodes. So it's about weighing the risks and the benefits and like we were saying before, Open communication with your doctor is key here. Couldn't agree more. It's a partnership, really. I thought it was really cool how the book got kind of sciency about how those medications actually work in the brain, like on a chemical level. Yeah, it breaks down those complicated neurotransmitter interactions without making your eyes glaze over. Really well done. <laughs> it's like these medications, they're these tiny little mechanics, right? And they're in there tinkering with the inner workings of your brain, trying to get everything running a little smoother. 
love that visual. It's like fine tuning a really complex machine. Mm -hmm. But what really hit me, what I loved, is that living with bipolar 2, it doesn't just focus on managing the symptoms, you know, it goes deeper. It encourages people to find purpose, to find meaning within their experiences. Like, even with this diagnosis, you can still live a life that feels, I don't know, authentically yours. It's about taking back your narrative, wouldn't yeah. you say? The book really encourages readers to follow their passions, to set goals that have zero to do with bipolar 2. Like, you can have this diagnosis, but it doesn't have to define you. It doesn't have to be the main plot point of your life. It's a subplot. Maybe a challenging one, but subplot nonetheless. And get this, the book even suggests there might be beauty, real beauty, in the bipolar experience. Yes. It talks about how the experience itself, as challenging as it can be, can also be a source of strength, resilience, creativity even. And it underlines how important it is to connect with others who understand, who truly get the unique ups and downs of bipolar too. That feeling of not being alone on this roller coaster is so important. I love that this book doesn't just acknowledge the darkness, you know. It highlights those flickers of light, those moments of hope, too. Exactly. And it doesn't just leave you with those hopeful thoughts, either. It wraps up with an entire chapter dedicated to resources, support groups, online communities, hotlines, book recommendations. It's all there. It's like the book saying, OK, we've covered a lot. Here's some tools. Now go out there and keep exploring, keep connecting, keep learning. Because this journey of managing bipolar, too, it's lifelong, right? But the more you know, the more you understand yourself, the more empowered you are to handle whatever comes your way. So well said. It's a journey of self-discovery, resilience, and ultimately hope. And to our listener who brought this incredible book to our attention, we really hope this deep dive has given you a better understanding of bipolar 2. Not just the facts, but what it actually feels like to live with this condition every day. It's complex, absolutely. But with the right knowledge and the right support, it is possible to create a life that is full, that is meaningful, that is truly yours. So thank you for diving in with us, and we'll see you next time for another deep dive.